Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today, I have with me one of our colleagues from the Portland Art Gallery, Emma McCold Burke. Nice to see you today. Lisa, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, one of my favorite recent stories was um, when you were in the gallery, and all of a sudden, my voice apparently came over the gallery system speakers. And I think I said something like, hello, this is Dr. Lisa Belial. Yes. Yeah. I was actually um, playing the podcast and our Bluetooth speakers hooked up to the the speaker in the gallery. And um, I think I think the even creepier part was you just said hello. So your voice kind of boomed through the gallery and this these poor couple was just kind of standing there and they were pretty spooked and I could I could tell. Um, but I paused it right after that and they were kind of looking around and I had to explain to them like, you know, this is kind of what happened. And then they shared with me that they're they're staying in this haunted hotel. And there was this ghost tour that kind of spooked them the night prior. So I really, I really got them on accident. <laughs> so I was actually an anonymous ghost then. Yes. In this particular case. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of thinking that it was it was almost like I was calling to you to come be with me on the radio show today. Well, and I will take that call. I'm happy. I'm happy to be here. That it worked out okay. It did. Did they tell you what hotel they were staying at? You know, I think it I think it was up up north, probably closer to Camden. So I think that um it was more that they were on the balcony and a ghost tour walked right by and, and the stop was their kind of hotel. Oh, so they went into this not realizing that this is what they were getting out of their stay. Right. Yeah. So I really spooked them at Portland Art Gallery, but we had a good, a good laugh. So I think they'll, I think they'll still come back. They'll probably, yeah, that's good to hear. Well, um, I remember there was a story that we did once when I was working for the magazines, and I and I believe that there is a hotel I think in Lewiston that has some strange backstory. Like the people that we had working with us, they were like staying in a crypt or something like that. And I think Maine actually has a fair number of spirits wandering about. Yeah, well, you know, I shared with them when I was quite young. Um, I grew up kind of going to Booth Bay, East Booth Bay and Ocean Point. And when I was really young, probably about seven, I, I went on a tour of Burnt Island and there was all of these ghost stories that I was told kind of touring the island. And there was very beautiful parts as well. Um, people um, doing their laundry outside and, and making pies. But all I really remembered, obviously, was the scary the scary stories. And and it scarred me for quite some time. But, um, you know, nevertheless, I'm, I'm still in Maine and loving it. And it didn't scare me too much. Yeah. So you're kind of you're kind of back again because you grew up in Maryland, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up um, kind of like right outside of Annapolis. Um, and then even though I was in Maryland, I've been coming to Maine all my life um, to Ocean Point. Um, but but um, settled here for kind of the first time in my life. So tell me about the art school excursion. You have a degree in painting, I believe, with I an art history minor. Yeah, I um, went to school in Philadelphia at Tyler School of Art. Um, I was really lucky to spend um, four years learning about painting and art history and kind of getting um, a wide range of, of lessons and learning and meeting professors. And um, while I was in school, my family moved to, to Yarmouth, where they are now. So why art? What was it about art and painting and art history that really called to you? Um, I think I've kind of always felt that connection, which I think is um, a lucky thing to be able to say. I think not everyone gets that opportunity to just kind of know this is something they care deeply about always. Um, my my grandma is actually an artist, and, and my grandpa... Um, was a was a surgeon, but he can draw as well, and um, he he taught me when I was quite young how to draw an apple, and and we would look at it and kind of dissect it and and learn to draw. And so from a very young age, I, I had been drawing. And then um, what I realized through school was that I really also connected with learning the history of it and and learning the stories behind the artwork, um, and then beginning to kind of apply that to some of my own my own paintings and my own conversations with my peers as well. You spent 
some time in Rome when you were going through school. Tell me about that. Yeah. So I, I was there for actually a, a year, which is also a really, I was very fortunate to have that experience. I think um, most people get to go for a semester, which is, you know, still an, an honor and, and such a lucky thing to have done. Um, but I feel extra lucky to have been there for so long. Um, so I was living actually like right, right by the, um, the, um, where the Pope is living. Now I'm blanking on the name, the Vatican City. Yeah. yeah. And so I would walk from school through the Vatican City to my to my um, home in, in Italy. And I was a painting major there as well. But I was learning a lot about um, kind of like natural materials. Um, so one of the projects we got to do was I built a fresco up in um, a small town in Italy with um, a materials class I was taking. And um, I got to, you know, there's so much art in Italy that I was so close to, which was really special. Um, so I was walking around and I was like, my school was near like six Caravaggios, so I could just pop into the churches and, and see them and spend some time with them. So I was really lucky that I got to live in Rome and really kind of see it for, for what it was. And um, studying abroad is such a romantic thing to get to do, but... I think I was glad I got to stay there for so long because it be kind of just came a real place that I could live and stay, stay in. Did you learn how to speak Italian before you went over? I took like a little class online, so I, I didn't know much. Um, I knew enough to kind of um, not get poked fun at at the, at the sandwich shop. Um, but I was, that was part of why I was so lucky I was there for a year is, is that I kind of picked up on enough and I could understand what people were saying, which, which kind of got me through. And um, I think what I, what I realized is that um, when, you're, when you're coming into someone's country and, and you don't speak their language, that um, English just so happens to be a language that a lot of people speak. But if you can put in the effort to really just, you know, say through a couple things in Italian, even if you're, you know, stumbling through, that it's appreciated. Um, so that was kind of my, my favorite part about just learning and um, giving the deli guys a hard time. But in Italian, it was, it was pretty fun. Did you live in a little neighborhood and get to know people that were around you? Yeah. So I lived like kind of right by this little grocery store and everyone would would have those like rolly carts with your groceries in them. And um, I was right by a market outdoors. So I became regulars in, in those places and then around my school as well, which was right on the, the Tiber River. So I, I kind of, a lot of people I think were traveling during that time, which I did a little bit as well too, but I really made a point to kind of like hunker down in, in Rome and get to know people and the places and, and spend time there. For the fresco that you created, you were using natural materials like crushed berries and other objects. Was this meant to be um, a fresco that would last a long time? Yeah, so it'll be there for thousands of years, which is pretty crazy. Um, it's it's in this little hilltop town called Casperia. And um, kind of the process is that you're putting plaster onto a wall that already exists, and then you're painting into it while it's still wet. Um, but the pigments we had made, which is really all you're putting into the wet plaster, um, was through some natural materials like um, saffron is a good example. Um, we would take berries and melt them down and, and kind of add vinegar to stabilize some of the color and then add that too as well. So um, there's a there's a beetle called cochineal. And when you crush up the shells and kind of add some either liquid to it or um, oil to it, it makes this like really um, beautiful and deep red. Um, so that was also something we were using. And um, lapis is kind of a historical way that um, blue was made. Um, so our professor was was bringing in that stone and we would crush it up and and add it to this to this fresco. So it was it was a learning experience in, in multiple ways. Obviously, I got to build a fresco, which is a very cool experience, um, but but also learning about um, being engaged with it all the way through. Um, so making those materials, making the fresco, making the painting, and then having it live for quite a long time. Was your professor or the school, was this something that they were known for? Did they do a lot of natural materials work? Um, it's a class that's actually offered both in the international campuses and, and on campus in Philadelphia. Um, I think my professor just had a specific liking to it, actually. Um, he's from America, but he's lived in Italy for a long time now, I think over 20 years. Um, so he, it's kind of his own research. Um, so 
he has this funny relationship kind of with cooking and art as well. That's kind of what so much of that is. Um, so he would teach us, we would make, um, I guess a good example is he brought in um, little squid and we dissected them in class. We kind of pulled out the ink sack, let it dry, set it aside. And then we had all of the squid left over. So he gave me a recipe on how to make um, risotto. So you take the squid ink and it's just like, dark, really rich risotto with the squid, the squid in it as well. And um, then we would come back and make paintings with the same ink. So he, it was just kind of his passion that he, he taught to us. And I think it was a specifically special class because I, where I was taking it. It's interesting because we're so um, technology forward these days and we are doing so much with the science around creating color. But you're talking about going back to the, to the roots of color, really. Right. Yeah. There's this um, recipe book actually by Chinini and it's, it's kind of like a handbook and it has all these recipes on how to make glue and how to make your own canvas and how to make your own tracing paper, all from those materials. And it was um, definitely a unique experience, but it's things I'm still using today in my own practice. So, yeah. Tell me about your art practice now. Um, it's a lot of, I'm, I'm actually, um, I have a studio at Running With Scissors in, in Portland, Maine. Um, and I have some good friends that I'm sharing a big space with in the warehouse, a kind of st like type building. Um, and I'm making paintings that are, are kind of a bit about sewing, a little bit about alternate materials. And um, I'm using this kind of old way of um gessoing a canvas with rabbit skin glue um, so it's see-through. So I'll, I'll go to Martin's and I'll, I'll grab some fabric and it's mostly kind of transparent and sew it together and then paint on top of it. Um, so it's mostly just about playing and materials and, and kind of experimenting and just having fun with it. So gessoing a canvas, what does that mean for those of us who are not... Um art majors in any way. Yeah. So a canvas, pretty much the, the basic structure is you have the stretcher bars, which are um, the frame behind it. And then you have just a raw canvas or really any material. So linen is another example. And then you put this kind of like acrylic um, white coat on it, which is wh what we normally see. Um, it's actually just like a marble dust. Um, and that just primes the canvas. So your paint will sit on top of that and not soak into the, the fabric behind it. Um, so it's just a way of prepping the canvas to be painted on top of. Why rabbit skin? The difference is that it's see-through, actually. So rabbit skin um, brings the canvas really tight. It's almost like a drum. It has kind of a shrinking ability. And you can um, reactivate it with heat. Um, because it's a biological um, substance, it's it's not permanent. Um, so it just gives me a little bit more room to play. Um, if something's not working, I can kind of just um, sand it off and even the friction will make it sticky again. Um, uh, gesso is also obviously really wonderful and a lot more stable than rabbit skin glue, which is why it's more widely used. Um, but for me, the rabbit skin glue just gives me a little bit of freedom to kind of make some mistakes and then um, play with them. So I'm going to go out on a limb and uh, say that you're probably not vegan. You know what? I actually don't eat meat. <laughs> I, for my own reasons, I, I don't eat um, meat. I eat fish and eggs, but I also don't eat dairy. I just have some dietary restrictions. Um, so that's kind of a, a comment I've gotten my whole kind of art career is I'm kind of fascinated with these more like biological um, textures that kind of show up. Um, but I, I'm not a big meat eater myself. So yeah. I mean, it's, I also don't eat meat and I also eat fish, but, um, so I think you're right. Everybody has their different reasons for doing things, but it, I wonder if you ever encounter people who are vegan, who say, uh, rabbit skin glue and crushed beetles and, and do you ever have to kind of have conversations about that? Absolutely. Yeah. I think the most interesting part about kind of use, utilizing these tools or these um, parts of the animal is that um, they're being used kind of purposefully and respectfully, um, which is what that class was kind of all about. So using all of the parts of, of the pieces and um, 
kind of noting that everything has a use, um, even if we maybe don't use it like that anymore. Um, so another example is my class made whole fish, like a fish cooked it whole, um, had a like beautiful meal that we all shared. And then we took the bones and boiled them for a long time and they make a gelatin that you can use as glue. So I think that um, when things are kind of being used anyway, um, you can kind of accept that if that's part of your life already and um, repurpose it so that you're being mindful of, of all those places that um, those things can actually be useful and, and um, kind of honored because they are so useful. Which is traditionally the way that animals were always, and really plants were always dealt with anyway, was with respect and honor and understanding that they were, it was part of the life cycle. And this is a kind of almost a gift that they're giving human beings, really. Exactly. Right. Which is why I feel so lucky to be like here in Maine, um, where I'm surrounded by so much nature. Um, my, I'm living with a, a couple of people who, who know a lot about plants. And um, a project we're working on is we're going to make a cyanotype, which is when you treat a subject or a, a fabric or a canvas with a certain kind of chemical that becomes reactive to the sun. And so you can kind of create this um, kind of solution, treat a fabric or a canvas or a paper, and then place objects on top of it and let it sit in the sun. And when you take those things off, um, those places will be white and the rest will be blue. So it's kind of like making a photograph or a print, um, but with those plants. And so being in Maine, I have plenty of foliage to choose from and kind of identify and learn about while also making um, kind of a piece with my friends, which is also really meaningful. I, I also think that plants are really very important. And even though I practice medicine, where most of the medicines that we use are pretty far removed from their plant origins, I still really enjoy growing chamomile for the chamomile flowers. And we have cone flowers, which is, um, you know, echinacea, essentially. So I think that there is this strong sense that many people have that it's important to connect back to what was once a, a bigger part, I think, of our living existence. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and I, I think also being in Maine, just I, I never spent a full year here. So I'd only seen the summers, which obviously are gorgeous, but Maine has so much more to offer than just that. Um, so beginning to learn what's in season and what plants I'm seeing and why I'm seeing them and the relationship to what's happening around us has been so interesting. And I think I'm in the perfect place for that to kind of dive in and, and engage with that. At the same time, you were also um, utilizing social media and specifically Instagram for an, a really interesting project. Yeah, um, my good friend and I, um, Liv Pancari, who's I knew I know from school, um, have kind of started this this page on Instagram and kind of this little um, program where we're we're connecting with other artists who um, maybe wouldn't connect otherwise. Um, as I'm, as I'm sure kind of everyone feels like during the pandemic connecting has been kind of hard and, and even more important because we can't connect in other ways. Um, and we realized that there's this kind of group of people that are fresh or fresh ish out of college and are missing some of that structure and connection that college provided us, especially, you know, being in the pandemic where, um, all of the classes are in zoom. So even if you are in school, you're just not um, seeing people or talking to people in the same way. And my friends and I kind of shared that feeling of like, I just want to talk to someone about my work casually and kind of judgment free and put the feelers out there with some of our other friends and, and people now even farther outside that circle and, and people are feeling the same. So we've gotten to, um, we have meetings on Zoom every month where people show their work and ask for some feedback and, and we get to just talk with them. And there's been some really mo like meaningful moments where, um, you know, someone I met in Portland, Maine has joined the Zoom and someone that I kind of knew in Philadelphia is now on the Zoom and they're connecting about like dance or something that just wouldn't come out in a, in a painting class together. So it's been really, really special to kind of be the facilitator for those, those kinds of conversations. And we're hoping to continue and expand it as well. What's the name of your Instagram page? Um, it's Well, we're the studio wall, um, and Liv Pancari is, is running it with me, and then our Instagram is on the studio wall. 
So this is something that people could look into if they wanted to. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've been doing other little like other programs as well. So um, we're having like monthly or quarterly shows um, on our Instagram and we're posting other things of like what's happening in the art news and maybe discussion questions around um, what is an artist statement. So we're just hoping to engage a, a variety of people and and kind of just casually talk about kind of like this, like what is art and, and what can it be and how can we engage with it? It seems like feedback is a really important part of um, progressing as an artist. And, and I know that it, it should be an important part of pretty much everybody's progression in every field, but it's very difficult. And especially now where um, we all want to be very sensitive of other people's feelings and we all want to understand where everybody's coming from. And at the same time, it's helpful to get really honest uh, engagement from people. So how do you strike that balance, kind of understanding how to be respectful and sensitive, but at the same time offer information that might be useful to other artists? Yeah, I think that was a skill I learned in school, actually. Um, I was having critiques all the time, which is the benefit of school, and I think that has really strengthened me as a person. Um, I think that it's helpful when someone says just how they're feeling, um, kind of talking about just your core feelings. Um, when someone says, you know, this makes me feel blank. And then you can kind of ask them. So it's fun to be the facilitator to kind of, um, when I hear someone say like, I don't know, this painting is making me feel, it's like a little wonky that I get to kind of just step in as someone say like, oh, cool. Like let's, talk about that and let's figure it out and kind of like, let's name what's kind of making you feel that way. Um, that way it's, it's not personal. And I think that's my favorite part about, um, setting this up kind of outside of a school environment, um, where there's no pressure. You, you don't even have to have gone to school at all to kind of join. Um, I actually met someone at the gallery last week who um, is in high school and, and looking at colleges and just needs some help um, with her portfolio. And I was excited to tell her like, hey, I actually know where you can go for that. And it's without judgment and we're not, um, you know, trying to make anyone feel bad, obviously. So I think the most exciting part about this scenario is that people are volunteering to have that feedback and actually saying, I need help, which is my favorite part too. Um, people who aren't afraid to ask for help and then people who also aren't afraid to give it. Um, and I think that if anything were to hurt someone's feelings, I would hope that someone would say, hey, that hurt my feelings. And then we can kind of go from there um, just because, you know, everyone is so valid to, to both say like, I need help. And then also hey, that's not the help I want. So, yeah. Do you ever find this uh, feedback skill useful when you're working at the gallery? Do artists ever ask questions about their work or about placement or about shows that you're putting up? Absolutely. Yeah. I think as an artist, your work is so personal and you know, it's, it's kind of your baby. So when it's going into a space, um, you want to know it's taken care of and, and, um, going to be appreciated. And the gallery obviously does a great job of that. Um, but sometimes artists will ask like, how was the reception of that piece? How did the show go? Um, which obviously they want to know. And, and we're, we're happy to tell them, you know, Hey, people are really engaging with this or, you know, maybe, you could do a work that's a little bit brighter or, and it's just, it's to everyone's advantage, I think, um, so that the artists can have their work best received um, and their skill set best received. And then um, the viewers have something that they can also engage with. Um, so I think that both giving and receiving feedback is really helpful, um, just kind of for everyone involved. Is it a delicate balance between uh, staying true to your art and also creating something that others would want to buy? Yeah, I think that's a pretty complicated question. Um, personally, I'm, I'm pretty early on in my art career, and so I haven't found that balance. Um, but working at the gallery has been really helpful to kind of see like, oh, what people are interested in, like that keeps going or that keeps like people are looking for something like this and getting a good sense of what the market is looking like. Um, I think that 
I think what I've realized is that you actually, you don't have to sell everything you're making. So if you find something that is really working, um, for me right now, it's this um, this kind of Instagram um, studio wall project. It's really engaging with people. So that's where I'm going to focus my time and kind of see how can I market that and ask people to engage with it. And the painting is just for me. Um, so I think that it's it's a balance, but I don't think you have to sacrifice either one. Do you think that's common that people who um, create physical art also do other types of things? They work in a gallery. They um, have an Instagram um, business. Is that something that you're seeing more and more? Yeah, I think um, the interesting part for me is being a young person, actually, my professor told me um, that he drove a Domino's car until he was 30, just to make that to make his practice um, viable as a viable option for him. So I think not only are artists used to multitasking to kind of make make things happen for themselves, but that also artists are creatives just kind of in everything they do. Um, so whether it's you know making the work and, and selling it and bringing it to a gallery and finding representation, or it's just kind of having some, you know, kind of hobbies on the side that become these really expansive projects just because you are a creative. I think it's, I think it's all kind of part of the gig. Um, I think I'm seeing a lot of that kind of around just even people in my studio um, have different avenues and are always trying new things. And, and that's really exciting. One of my favorite stories about you, Emma, is that you kind of came to the gallery at the very beginning of the pandemic and you essentially said, I'll do anything. I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer. I'll, I'll do whatever you want. And this was at a time where a lot of other people were kind of drawing back and just for, for very personal reasons, needing to um, not put themselves out there in the world more. But you just kind of jumped right in. And, and it's, I mean, I think it's been an interesting ride for you. So what is it about your personality that caused you to step forward and really seek out that additional experience um, where others maybe didn't, that wasn't a comfort that they had. Yeah. Well, I think I sat in a really u- unique position where I was new to Maine. So um, I moved here in March from Philadelphia kind of unexpectedly. Um, so I didn't know how long I was going to be here. Um And because I didn't really know how long I was going to be here, I was willing to do anything. I didn't know anyone. I kind of just knew my family, who I obviously love dearly, but um, needed a little bit more connection outside of them. Um, So I I just needed to get my hands on something. I I think I was lucky to have the um, option to just kind of you know, I was living with my family, so I could, I could kind of just jump in anywhere and didn't have many, many needs. <laughs> I just wanted to do it. Um, and I was, I was lucky to have that, but I think I also was just having to leave the network I had in Philly, um, and not having that same network here in, in Maine yet. I was just dying to meet other people and, and get back into the art field, um, and kind of make a space for myself in one way or another. Yeah, that's really tough. So the pandemic is already hard enough and leaving Philadelphia is already hard enough and you get both at the same time and you're trying to have have a life for yourself up here. Right. Yeah, it was it was pretty hard. Um you know, I spent a lot of time rollerblading in Yarmouth at like 9 p.m. because my family went to bed at 8.30 and I wasn't used to that. Um, so there was a lot of that, but also that's what the gallery was was for me, is that was how I made friends and kind of actually how I made most of my friends. Um, I was I was joking earlier that that's also how I found my apartment, actually, um, through the director's, the director's daughter um, was subletting a room. And now my roommates are some of my good friends. So, you know, the gallery kind of gave it all to me. Obviously, you know, I, I got to engage with people and and they they liked me, but um, that kind of background really helped me kind of get my foot into into the Portland scene and, and meet people and, and establish like a life for myself that now is super full of joy. I'm very glad to hear that. And I I think that it's it says I think it says something about about um, probably about your family as well, that they would even create the space for you not only to live with them, but also to just be your own person. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think I come from a family of, um, 
really tenacious people um, who are, aren't afraid to fall, which is what I really admire. Um, but when you do fall, you you kind of let yourself you let yourself fall and you accept it and you can kind of grant yourself some grace there. And because you're able to do that, you also are able to get back up. Um, so that's something my mom has really taught me and has always kind of reminded me as well, even when I forget it. Um, so in that whole, you know, like moving to somewhere and not knowing anyone, it was really hard, but I kind of just let myself say like, yeah, it's hard. You know, I, I'm, I'm in a little bit of a unique position and, and, it was funny kind of telling people, you know, yeah, I just moved here in a pandemic. And they'd say, oh, wow, you know, that's really hard. And that acknowledgement, too, just kind of let myself fix up. Like, I am in an exceptionally hard position, and that's okay. And, and now that I've kind of accepted that, I can also accept that, you know, it's not forever, and I'll get out of it. Why did you choose this piece behind us, this Petraea Noise piece, which I believe is called Swimmer's... 1910? It is, yeah. So Petraea, I think, connects to what I was talking about a little bit earlier about these alternate materials. Um, she kind of has this unique way of working. Um, her She's using this interesting process that is taking these photos that are kind of in this archive from, I believe, her grandparents um, and manipulating them and editing them and altering them. Um, and then... Um, this is actually an old way of working for her, but printing them out quite large. Um, on, in this case, I believe it's on rice paper. There's kind of this like texture in, in the piece um, that's from that certain kind of paper. And then there's this high gloss um, medium on top, which kind of catches those, those ripples in the paper and accentuates some of the patterning in the design. Um, so I chose this piece because, you know, not only is Petraea working in a, a really different way of making um but she's also kind of connects to what i was what i was just talking about of um being adaptable and and tenacious in her making um she, she has this funny story about this printer she bought and it's just not working the same way because this large printer um is no longer working for her and um Obviously, it's quite frustrating that it won't work, but she's still making paintings. They're just different. Um, so they're a bit smaller, and they're, they're bringing in some other painterly designs that are new for her. So regardless of those kind of like tribulations of, or you know, technical difficulties, um, she's just making regardless. So that's kind of why I brought her in today. So for people who are listening to the podcast, how would you, how would you describe this piece? To me, I think that um, what's interesting about it is you're not quite sure how it's made. Um, so you, it kind of asks you to spend some time with it and really get in there visually. Um, there's this kind of mystery of how it's made and then kind of um, a clearer image of these of these swimmers. Um, the date to me kind of references that that archive of, of photos that she's referencing from and using um, in her work. Um, so it's this interesting, like, kind of lineage um, of family documents that she's making her own and then um, making quite large as well. Um, so for personally, I just feel like it's it's engaging both, like, maybe in my art history sense, it's kind of engaging that part, and then also um, as a painter in a medium sense, engaging that part as well. Um, so just kind of drawing from each pieces and bringing them together pretty seamlessly. And when, when I look at it, it's, it's obviously a picture of what appear to be two male figures wearing old-fashioned swimming outfits, but it almost looks as if they're, they could be wearing masks. I know that there probably aren't. It's probably just a shadow. But there's some sort of interesting mystery, some sort of story that I start to tell myself about what the, this could possibly be. Yeah, that's I love that. I think that's actually one of my favorite things of working at the gallery is is hearing other people's interpretations. Um, yeah, I think there's something kind of hidden in their faces that gives them this kind of like ambiguous, um, not quite sure who they are. Maybe that's also their outfits, those swimming outfits we don't see anymore. Um, but I love that interpretation because I think that kind of says a lot about what we've been through the last year 
and and how that's affected how we're perceiving things. Um, so, you know, to hear that this reminds you of, of our reality today is really exciting, actually, because of maybe how old this actual photo um, is, that it can it's still so relevant and um, reminding you of, of our life around us today. It's also interesting because if you look closely at the photo, even though there is shadow around their faces and their necks, you could still see their mouths underneath and there, and one, at least one of them seems to be smiling. Right. Yeah. Well, it reminds me almost of those, there's those jokes of like, oh, we're going to all have um, sunburn on our faces and not where our masks are. And there's that funny outline, except it's in reverse. Um, yeah, but there's those smiles. So maybe it's that kind of persistence and, and just assertion that um, we're going to make it through and we're going to make the best of it regardless. Um, I think that's a, a good interpretation. Well, not being an artist myself and being in medicine where I hear a lot of stories, for me, the story is also very important. Not only the story of the piece, um, whether it's my interpretation or whether it's the story that comes from the artist, but also the story of the artist uh, themselves, because that really connects me uh, personally with the artwork. I think if I was a collector or if I had a more, I guess, objective view of art, then I might feel differently, but I'm not any of those things. So when I've had a chance to sit down and talk with people, um, it just makes me, it makes me want to kind of be the collector of kittens and I, I want a piece from everybody. You know, I want, I want to like be able to kind of create this little family of artwork in my home because I, I know and love these artists and the work that they do. Right. Yeah. That's what I think we're experiencing in the gallery as well. And that's kind of my favorite part about um, having worked there for now a little bit um, is, is knowing all those stories. So it's really fun when someone points to a piece, um, a story that comes to mind is those Eric Hopkins fish. And there's some story about he brought this beautiful fish that he just caught. I think it might have even been the first fish he caught to his mom. And when he pulled it out of the ocean, it was shimmering in all these colors. And then he brought it to his mom and obviously it was dead. So it wasn't those colors anymore. And his mom said, oh, no worries. And pulled out some paint and they painted right on the fish and recolored it, whatever colors Eric wanted. And that story for people hearing when they're seeing these pieces in front of their face, um, just really kind of connects them and brings that artist kind of closer to their heart um, and reminds them that these are people that, um, you know, the gallery is lucky to interact with them pretty frequently. So they're, they're not these faraway figures. They're, they're just people who are around and have these stories and who everyone can connect with. Is there traditionally more of a mystique around artists, a sense of the artist or those people over there who are doing that artwork, and then there's the rest of us, and we just kind of live our lives, and we wait for that special moment where we might interact with pieces of creativity and the people who create them? Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's, um, it's an interesting kind of archetype of these artists that are kind of these creative geniuses. And I think it does actually a disservice almost to the artists because artists are allowed to fail and artists are allowed to make mistakes because they're people just like you and me and they have breakfast every morning and they ride a bike and they do all the things that we do. And I think kind of putting them on this pedestal also does us a disservice because we can't connect with them in the same way. And it's so funny. Um, seeing these artists and getting to work in the gallery and seeing them regularly and then you know telling my friends you know oh yeah Eric Hopkins was giving me a hard time we were joking in the gallery the other day and he's kind of this figure for them and a real person to me and I think that um that kind of distance isn't isn't helpful um for the artist or for the people looking to kind of connect with that artwork because um we're all just people um those people are just making something that you 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 happen to like and 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 you're probably doing something also as well that that artist would be interested in so i think just kind of understanding that as valuable as those pieces are that um we all have our value and um i think people always say you know i think you might have even said it i'm not an artist but 
I think everyone kind of is, you know, you're creative in your own sense. And even though you might not, that might not be oil paint for you, that's, that doesn't discredit yourself. And I think that that sentence tends to do that. So for me personally, I, I kind of feel like, um, that distance isn't that helpful and, and we can all kind of just accept that we're, we're all creatives in our own sense. Well, I know that my mother and my father both watch Radio Maine on a regular basis. She is a longtime teacher, and he is a longtime um, family doctor. And my mother will send me texts after she watches these or listens to them and says, oh, I really, I learned this, I learned this, I learned this. And she was the original person who told me, oh, I'm not a creative person, which I think you're right. I think that when we think um, that we have to go to art school or we have to know how to use pastels, Um, it probably does somehow distance ourselves from something that we really have the ability within us each to do. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, Emma Wilson is a perfect example. She is a creative in her own sense. Those shows every month are curated beautifully. And there's this always this sense of color and and tying that comes in. And she'll always say, you know, I'm not an artist myself, but all she's really saying is she can't paint, which is just one form of creating. Um, So I think that every month when people come in and those shows are so engaging and that piece of artwork is now jumping out at you. It's intentional and it's because of her craft and her creativity that makes that happen. I've noticed the same thing with this show because I I come in and I have the opportunity to speak with people like you and this is something that I really enjoy. And on the other side of our camera and our audio, um, there's actually a crafting around that. And I know that... um, Kevin Thomas, who happens to be the art gallery owner, that's not his original craft, but he has is teaching himself. And so it's becoming its own way of um, weaving things together. And every week gets a little bit better. And every week we, he learns something. So you're, you're, you're making a good point that this is something that we, we can be creative in lots of different areas, lots of different ways. Right. And maybe that kind of like search for knowledge is, is what's at the basis of it. I think in these examples we keep bringing up, there's this, um, just kind of curiosity, um, which is which leads to some creative solutions, um, which is kind of characterizing each of these kind of creative people we're identifying as the the reach the or um, approaching an obstacle and and then saying, hmm, how can I get around this instead of just saying, oh, I can't go there. So I think that kind of um, search for an approach or search for learning or search for more knowledge is what kind of brings creative um, solutions and creative thinking and creative people to those places. What has it been like for you now that the um, gallery openings are live and in person? I, I think you've, I think it's been two or three maybe? I think two. Yeah. They have been so much fun. I, I haven't, really gotten to go to many ever in, in Philadelphia either. I was always at school or they were through the school and those were fun, but they were just kind of my peers. Um, so it's really, really exciting to kind of just chat with these artists as much as I'm, you know, we're seeing them in the gallery and, and getting to um, talk with them. Um, it's it's a little bit more casual at the opening, which is which is so fun to just really hear like, what their lives are like and what they're up to and how they're feeling and seeing them on a more personal level um, is, has been really meaningful. And, and then also to meet people who just walk in and kind of say, what's going on here? And how can I, how can I be engaged? And to open them, like welcome them with open hands is also really exciting. They're always kind of surprised, but um, it's, it's been really exciting. So after more than a year of doing things virtually, to be able to have people back into the space and really interact on a human level, it sounds like that's pretty rewarding. It is really rewarding. And I think um, the interesting thing is that I came in not knowing otherwise. Um, So when I first kind of started the gallery, the gallery was just very, very temporarily had its doors closed, um, like everyone else. Um, so there was no one in. And then slowly it's been this progression of, okay, now more people are coming in and 
you know, now slowly the mask mandate has changed in Maine. So I'm seeing people's full faces for the first time. I've, I've had a whole relationship with them and, and now I finally know what they actually look like. And, and then I get to see them and I get to actually hang out with them and, and chat just kind of about ourselves, which is really fun. Um, so it's, it's been a, a wonderful, um, position to watch it all just kind of unfold and kind of flourish in its, in its reopening. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because I I started my job in Waterville um, as a doctor, and I had barely started, and the p- pandemic started, and now I've only ever seen most of my patients with masks on. So I actually have very little idea of what they look like. And so I'll do a virtual visit, and I'll be doing it over the computer, and I'll be thinking to myself, wow, I had no idea that this person's face was like that. So I think you're right. When we finally are able to, in healthcare, take our masks off, everybody's going to be a little surprised by the person on the other side. It's so funny. Yeah, I I think I met Jody Edwards um, pretty recently for the first time without a mask. And she said, oh, I didn't even recognize you. And and I, I think as far as like sometimes the makeup on my face, I'm pretty recogni- recognizable. Um, so it's funny to hear that. It makes that big of a difference. Um, no one no one can really tell who you really are until you you see that full face, which is, which is really interesting and exciting that um, we're getting to be in a position where, you know, we, we can see a full face because then I think the connection is even deeper and, and fuller. That makes me think about all the small children who have never seen faces without masks and what they're going to think on the other side of it. Like, oh, that's really odd. Right. The ultimate peekaboo game, I think, for them. Good way to look at it. Yes. It's just they probably won't even think any strangely of it. They'll be like, OK, well, that's what that's what they always do with me anyway. So no big deal. Right. Talk about adapting. I think those those children will be, um, you know, kind of growing up with that lesson instilled in them quite young. Yes. Again, good way to look at it. We're, we're helping people with their adaptability. Right. Well, I've really enjoyed my conversation with you here today. Um, obviously, you have a lot of different interests, and we're fortunate to have you as a colleague at the Portland Art Gallery because you're bringing your interests in um, and kind of marrying them with the work that has been done for the last few years through the gallery. So it's really been great to get to know you better. Thank you so much. I'm I'm so happy with being part of that team at the gallery and and being in Portland. I've been speaking with artist and also Portland Art Gallery colleague, Emma McCold-Burke. Um, it's been a really fun conversation for me because I have known Emma from a distance through COVID. And I think that those of you who don't know her probably should go into the gallery and get to know her a little bit better. She's really pretty delightful. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you.